<clears throat> hey everybody, it's Nick and Walker at Full Spectrum Laser and welcome to Laser Talk. We're here again on a Wednesday to answer all your questions and talk about some new and interesting things going on in the world of lasers here at Full Spectrum Laser. What we are going on this week, Walker? So we're going to talk about how to set up your own laser business. Now, uh, what do you mean laser business? So a business using your laser, right? So a lot of people when they buy our lasers, they're actually doing so to either add a new feature to their business or to create a new business all their own. Um, there's actually a really short uh, return on investment on most of our machines. We're going to go a little bit over that and some of the things you can encounter and go through as you start a new business. Yeah, we're going to go over the types of lasers and profile your business type, right? Absolutely. So we'll go through the hobby series and kind of some of the things you can do to make money and start a business uh, using your hobby laser. And then if you're really going to be a business owner and the, and the laser is going to be something you're going to depend on for your business, you really should be using a pro laser. So we'll go over some of those and fibers and how you can integrate both systems together to uh, do different kinds of businesses. So now going into hobby lasers, what, what kind of business would use a hobby laser? So this is a, something you want to do as a small business, small investment, something uh, maybe you have a shop, you want to add a small addition to uh, your offerings. You can get a hobby laser for use of maybe 20 hours or less a week. Now, if you're in full production of parts or uh, products, a hobby laser is probably not uh, what you want to go. But um, using a hobby laser to add a facet to your business, like if you were a wedding planner or someone who worked in the wedding industry and wanted to add wedding toppers, personalized gifts, seat plettings, you know, there's a hundred things you can do for weddings with a hobby laser that, you know, you're only doing 20 or 50 at a time for a wedding and doing that per week, you know, you're only going to do as a wedding planner a wedding or two a week anyway. That's pretty feasible to get a hobby laser to knock out something like that. I, I actually have a friend that makes these like antique teddy bears oh, wow. and she actually cuts the patterns for the bears, but it's, she has to hand cut them all the time. But she only makes maybe two or three a week, which would be perfect for the laser cutter. She just throws it in there, cuts that same pattern over and over, just with different fabrics. Yeah. And then, you know, she's only making three or four weeks, so that's probably a good use, yeah? Absolutely. So, like, made-to-order things or things that are going to be, uh, you know, one-offs, uh, Hobby Laser is perfect for that. Um, I use the Hobby Laser a lot for gifts. So, instead of uh, trying to figure out what to get someone, you know, get some things that you can personalize for them or make something personalized for them. Kids love signs for their doors and other things to personalize their stuff, especially if they have a unique name that you can't oh, yeah. find on the rack someplace. The monster lives here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so what? Else? So uh, another thing uh, which is great for the Muse uh, is jewelry. So we went over this last week. Um, get this in here. Um, doing jewelry like this of this size, earrings. Um, a lot of people like these adorable little Scotties. You can not only make the earrings, but you can do the packaging. This is just some um, cardstock we use to do the packaging. You can engrave right on that. And so you can not only have the product, but the packaging right there without having to outsource anything like that, which makes the, the laser really ideal for starting a small business or adding a little asset to your business. Now, if you can imagine any small gift store that wanted to do their own personalized tags or uh, do an offering of personalized wooden tags during the Christmas time, I mean, a new hobby laser would be perfect for that, especially with the camera on board. Yeah, I mean, even with the hobby laser, you can do pretty large production. I mean, you're not going crazy, but you can bust out if you're just doing tags, you know, hundreds That's in a day. Absolutely. Easy. So how many hours a week would you use the hobby laser? I would use it like 20. That's what we rate the Hoppy Laser for, is about 20 hours of use or less a week. So just keep that in mind as you're using it for production and uh, considering it for, uh, you know, your business. It's a, it's a very solid system. It's just that that tube is a lot smaller, so. Absolutely. And that's, that's what comes to, like, go converting to a pro. I would really consider the tube itself. Yep. And, if, and your application. If your application is larger than 20 by 12, go with a pro. Absolutely. And uh, something we've noticed that sometimes the 90 watt tube is a little too much power for certain things. If you're doing a lot of delicate cuts and not doing anything more than 
cardstock or cardboard, you really don't need anything more than a 40 or 45 watt tube, so keep that in mind, especially as we have a shameless plug coming for our special on the Pro 20 watt uh, series laser. Now you get the Pro 20 with the uh, chiller right there for 4,500 bucks. The deal's right here below. Um, again, give the sales guys a call if you're looking for that. Now it's the same size uh, as your hobby laser, except you have a Z table, you got the pass-through doors, um, and you got the Pro, um, I don't say durability, but it's just, it's a workhorse. You ruggedness. Know? It's a lot of ruggedness. Uh, and the footprint's not much bigger. Actually, um, Charles made a great uh, footprint here as we transfer into the uh, Pro Series of Machines. Uh, here's what a uh, the footprint of a uh, Pro 24 looks like in a common office. Um, What's that? Oh, sorry. So we don't have this one right now, but uh, we'll bring that up here um, in a little bit. Uh, Charles will go uh, yeah. pull that up for us. But even on the Pro 20, Pro 24, very easy to fit into 36-inch uh, doors in your house and um, put them into any really uh, workspace. Yeah, that, that's the best thing is you're still getting a Pro <laughs> with all the benefits. It just fits through a door. There's so what would you, uh, what other kind of businesses would you say uh, you're ready to go and uh, move into a Pro uh, series for? It I mean, honestly, I, I see it going for anything. It, it's like if you're adding just assets to a business, like you said, cards or something, even business cards, um, just mass, if you want to do mass production, a pro is where you want to go. Absolutely. Uh, another thing is to consider the size. So if you're doing mass production or uh, larger objects, uh, the pro series is something you really want to consider uh, just for the sake of... Uh, Let's say you were going to do a uh, set of earrings like this on the Muse. You could probably put, what would you say, 30 in there at a time? Yeah. On a Pro, you're running off, you know, maybe three months worth of supply in a single sheet. And then another thing is you can start buying material at the sheet size. So by getting a Pro 48, what's the great advantage is you can now uh, really buy bulk material and get four foot by eight foot sheets of material through the pass through doors of that Pro 48 machine, which is ideal for cutting costs when you're starting a business. Um, companies like Steamy Tech, we were at their great facility in San Jose. Mm -hmm. uh, they make those uh, great um, gear based and uh, Steam Tech based, um, uh, you know, different coasters and uh, gears. If you've ever been to a Maker Fair and you saw the guy with the top hat with the movable gears in it, that's Greg at Steamy Tech. You can't miss them. Greg and uh, Greg Laura and Laura, I always forget sweet Laura. Um, uh, Greg and Laura down at Steamy Tech, uh, make sure you check them out. Um, but uh, they buy their sheets um, in uh, bulk uh, from a distributor which delivers right to their shop and they use the big uh, four foot by eight foot sheets right in their dual head laser which is another uh, laser you can <coughs> use which uh, takes the full sheet of material. I, I also like to say that they, they sourced really good wood. Absolutely. They didn't just buy like the largest piece they could find. They source locally the best like flat quality wood they could get. Absolutely. And that's another thing to consider when you're using lasers. The quality of your material is essential to the uh, quality of the output. Uh, it's like anything. You can't just put um, you know, you can't just put crap in there and expect gold to come out. You know, you got to put yeah. some good material inside. Uh, Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it'd be great if we could just put some lead inside, laser, and have yeah. a gold. I think someone made a commercial where you can put a full chicken inside and chicken nuggets come outside. Yeah, something that like works. that. Or um, a large globe that was made inside that's four sizes oh, the size yeah. of the machine. Yeah, it didn't it's take a, a while. It's though. amazing. Uh, take like, that would, how many, how long do you think that would really take on a hobby machine to make a globe that was this I size? I, I did that cardboard piece that was stacked and that took me a week on a pro. So, so yeah, I mean, just consider that too. If you're going to try to do large pieces, especially install pieces, um, the great people uh, out in uh, Portland, Oregon, um, 30 Circles, they do big installs. I'll actually do, be doing a big install here in Las Vegas at a uh, art festival. They're doing a large pyramid install where all the sections are, um, you know, I think three foot by three foot in sections. So they're doing that on their Pro 48 machine. It's a pretty impressive structure. Uh, what else we got on the Pro? So um, with the Pro, you got to think about too, um, let's say you're going to start a business um, and you want to kind of diversify. It's kind of the best part about having a laser. Let's say you were making stuff like this and you said you wanted to go, you know, I'm not making as much money as I wanted to with the jewelry, uh, but my husband's a gamer. We could start making dice towers, game pieces, um, the player tokens, map trains, different things like that, and just go up to your local game shop and see if they're interested in uh, either consigning them or you know buying them at bulk and selling them on the shelf. You can imagine those sitting on the shelf in a big bucket for uh, what would you say they'd sell for, Scott? A quarter piece, fifty cents a piece, something like that. Unmarked, but if you put designs on them, you could. Triple that. Oh wow! So if you think about that. You can buy, you know, tokens like that sell on Amazon, you know, for pennies on the uh, item, and if you can sell them for a dollar each, that's a pretty good markup on those kind of items. 
Jason, yeah, Jason on Facebook just said he's ready to upgrade from his Muse to uh, Pro with a Z table and pass through. Uh, Jason, you would be surprised how much we use that Z table with the pass through doors. It's um, pretty impressive. Um, my favorite thing about it is being able to put large items in it, like the ukulele. And what other big items have we engraved lately? Oh, we did the uh, the jewel box. Yeah, the jewel box. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Oh, I'm here we go. So. Uh, Charles made this great setup here. Here's just a couple of uh, typical tables and desks uh, that you'd see the size of. And that's the Pro 24 uh, sitting in a workspace. Now, the Pro 24 is the least expensive way to get into a 90 watt machine. Uh, it's got a 24 by 16 inch bed. It's a little bit bigger than that even. Uh, with the Z tables and the pass-through doors, this will fit the uh, two foot wide sheets of uh, raw material, which is great. Um, this is our most popular model for a reason. Uh, it's the easiest way to get into a 90 watt machine. It's still got a lot of room. We have it in one of them in our space here. Uh, we love it. This is by far our favorite machine. Um, we love the Muse, obviously. That's um, pushing every bit of advancement on the hobby laser side with the camera and the touch screen and the, uh, especially RE3. Mm -hmm. But uh, when RE3 gets on this Pro 24, <laughs> whew, it's gonna be real good, real good. Okay, so what else have we got? Any questions coming in from the internet yet? Yeah, Just yeah. how awesome we are. Jason oh. has another question. Oh, what do we got, Jason? I'm ready. How much faster can a pro raster over the Muse? To be honest, it's about an inch per second on both machines. It's really about the power and then the durability of the machine. Um, you can go a little bit faster on the Pro, probably in the sense that you're going to get more effective space um, for the engraving. So with a 90 watt, um, how can I say it? So I would slow down a lot of engravings on the Muse to do one single pass to have a nice deep engraving. But the, with the 90 watt, you can go at 100% speed with 100% power and still get a nice deep dark engraving on the machine. That's probably my favorite thing about the Pro Machine with the upgrade. You hit it on the head. On the head? Yeah. Look at that. You got it. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <coughs> okay, what else have we got? I think on Facebook, that's... Oh, Ralph Rumery, I'll tell you, it is too bad, but the beautiful thing about our company is we are always research and developing, and our engineers right now are actually putting together a package where in the future there'll be a 3D camera on the Pro, mm -hmm. along with RE3 and an LCD touchpad. So all those it's things coming. are coming. Uh, don't worry, uh, we're catching up. So uh, our you know, 2019 models, uh, you know, we'll have that uh, in store. Okay, now um, another thing uh, we want to kind of move on to is the fiber laser. And maybe this is not the greatest time to have these things um, oh, yeah. come up, but the, um, the fiber laser is a great addition if you're going to have a few different types of applications in your business. Now, why is the fiber laser better than the uh, CO2? Well, it's a different type of machine. Uh, if you're just doing engravings, especially if you're going to do tumblers, if my core business was going to just be engraving tumblers mm. and I could pick one of our machines, it wouldn't be a pro CO2. No way, it would be an open uh, FD system. Um, with that open FD system, the speed and accuracy you get uh, doing uh, with the fiber laser and engraving, you're able to do essentially four times as much product as you would on the CO2 with nearly 10, I mean 10 times is probably a little bit of an exaggeration, please don't quote me on that, but the accuracy and uh, we'll get a graphic um, up from a previous show perhaps if Charles can pull it from the archives, I'm kind of putting him on the spot mm. here. Um, yeah. But the um, the accuracy from the Pro uh, CO2 to the fiber is is very very noticeable to the naked eye. Yeah, the detail is just crazy on that. The, like especially <coughs> on something anodized, you can mm. remove it with the CO2, but when you do it with a fiber machine, the crispness like there's no bleed at all with when it comes to like tight tight uh, detail. Absolutely. So you can not only do tumblers, but imagine if you were at a uh, you know, whether you're at a knife and firearm show and you, everyone would want to have their pocket knife or something engraved, though it's a very easy service to provide at a show. If you can imagine you're setting up a uh, little show there and offering a $50 engraving service or $25 engraving service for small engravings on people's phones and different things you get at a knife and firearm show, whether it's accessories, scopes, and different things like that, um, they could uh, very easily uh, pay off your laser in just a few shows. Um, mm. But another great application um, is different kinds of tags, uh, whether it's dog tags, pet tags, different things like that. The fiber laser is used um, to not only mark into metal, but it also um, will engrave into it. So you can not only um, leave a mark on it, but you can actually go into depth. Depth, yeah. yeah. So they have the ATF, uh, what is that, the ATF engraving depth Absolutely. for the firearms. 
And actually, those dog tags, you mentioned dog tags. The literal dog tags at the pet store, they're made with lasers now. I remember yeah. when I was a little kid, they had the CNC machine. Yeah. But now they have a, just a crazy fiber laser. I think at um, our fair uh, military establishments, they're still doing dog tags with a stamp. Oh, that's if there's new recruits out there who can tell me differently, please do. But I think they're still doing stamps, yeah? Anybody? It seems like maybe we need to call the U.S. Army and get them a fiber laser. Yeah. Epilogue, don't steal our idea. <laughs> okay, so what else have we got? Another question coming over? Jeff Hayes, what's a fiber laser sold in the same size as a glass tube laser? So it's a little bit different. Uh, the fiber laser has a much smaller effective area. So your effective area on your fiber laser is about the size of my hand here. Um, we'll get the numbers here, but I believe it's about a six inch by six inch uh, work area. Uh, what's great about it is there's two different systems. There's an open and closed system. With the uh, closed system, uh, your work area is kind of limited from what you can do, but if you get an open system, you just need to put eyewear on, and you can put a large object on there. So you could put a guitar underneath, you could put you know, a large firearm, you could put a rifle, Excuse me, a large, um, I guess a lot of people are doing those uh, titanium canoe paddles and putting the teams on them from the college. That's what one oh of our yeah. uh, purchases got for. Um, a lot of people use it for marking um, not only uh, laptops, but walkie-talkies and batteries because uh, they engrave on very small items and put serial numbers. The fiber machines also do auto serialization. So if you just set up how you want the serialization to be entered, you can just put it through, hit next, and it'll automatically do the next serial number for you, um, which is an easy thing to do. So you can log that afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of, lot of great uh, features with the fiber laser. Um, there's actually things you can set up for automation where they have um, you know, a conveyor belt that goes through the open system and moves your product, marks it, moves it next, marks it, moves it next, marks it. Just throws it in the box. Absolutely. Box boxes it up for you. Yeah, so if you can imagine having a, even a jewelry store and you wanted to um, put personalization or put people's, uh, uh, you know, the engraving of their initials or a message on their wedding bands, you could easily do that with the uh, rotary chuck. Uh, we actually, um, next week we'll have some video of that, of an engraving of some in initials on the inside of a ring from our uh, fiber laser. One of our customers sent it in to us. <coughs> Excuse me. Looks like John Shaw's asking, Walker, uh, will RE3 for the Pro Series be a software download? So RE3 is going to live on the machine just like it does the Muse. Absolutely. So it's going to live on the machine, throw the IP address, and you just throw that IP address in your browser, whatever it may be. We whether prefer you use uh, Chrome, though, yeah. right? Yeah. Whether it be on a Mac or Windows or Linux, it's going to work. Absolutely. Uh, the beautiful part about that is you don't need to be connected to the internet, just to the same network that your machine is connected to. So yeah. you can hardwire your machine into the um, you know, the router, or you can connect via Wi-Fi. So there's a really uh, easy connection. As long as the machine's on, you can access the software. I think it's confusing for people when we say, like, open your browser, and they don't get that. It's not internet-based. It's just browser-based. <laughs> Absolutely. So like um, uh, com a lot of browser-based software are actually cloud-based software where you're accessing um, through the internet on the cloud um, someone's software base. Uh, in this case, you're not accessing it through the cloud, you're just accessing it through the local network and that actually lives on your machine. So the software is always there on your machine. You never need to be connected to the internet to use it. Yes. One more over there. Jeff Hayes, oh. okay, we'll make sure we uh, reach out to you and uh, give you some information about the Pro Machines. We appreciate you uh, you're watching. Oh, he's going to come here next month. I'm going to be in Las Vegas. We'll uh, give us a call. We'd love to have you in the uh, showroom and do a demo. We just did yes. uh, a demo today for a prominent guitar company that will probably be using our lasers to uh, do some research and development um, as they make new guitars, which is uh, pretty interesting. Um, cool. So what else we got going on today on the show, Walker? Um, I think we're bloating about some customers, right? We got some pretty cool customers. We have uh, this... Um, this is, um, we have some unique uses of the machine that we can talk about. Uh, I just saw the graphic come up. Sorry about that, Charles. Uh, some of those unique uses, um, uh, actually, where's our Lumbertown little box with the... There we go, right there. Yeah. Can I have everything with that, the kit and everything? I'll grab it. Tell me about that. So, we got... Glider Tech. Now, Glider Tech um, is a company that Merrill Brady started. Here's his information. If you guys want to check it out, give me a focus on their camera. There we go. That's better than a lower third. So, Glider Tech makes these great glider kits that you can order and you know, assemble what he laser cuts. So, he sent us one of these great little things. Here's an example of one of his little accessories. He sends out a sheet like this 
which has the parts that just pop out. And Walker, if you want to start popping a few of those out, when you're done, you assemble it, and it becomes this neat little caddy. Now, in the caddy is a place for your glue, your hardener, I believe, and your um, X-Acto knife. So those are the tools you need to assemble the, uh, the gliders. Here's a profile of one of the um, wing sections that's used to make the glider. And as you can see, these sections just pop apart really easily. He's ingeniously made it so that the pieces line up uh, back to back and then they just notch together and with just a little touch of glue, uh, you can have this thing set and put together. And um, what a neat little thing to have on your workstation to go along as you're making your glider. So, so does this come with his glider? Uh, actually, I think, is this an accessory that you come with or is this one thing that's just added when you buy a glider? Do you know, R Ruben? Um, we'll, have to check, we'll have to check it out. Either way, um, check out um, Merrill and his great company, Glider Tech. Uh, the information's right there. That's mmglidertech.com. All laser cut and vacuum formed. Um, so they also do uh, cost, um, sorry, um, composite fabrication, um, laser cutting and vacuum forming. So give them a call. There's some few pictures of their uh, gliders. Here's a wing section of one of the gliders. That's all laser cut. What, what machine does he have? What was that? Actually uses a pro machine. Okay. Here's another, uh, is that the only one? We, okay. <laughs> Two <laughs> each, right. yeah, sorry about that. Uh, next is Cindy. Uh, Cindy Garcia actually got one of our Mies, uh through our contest. Uh, she submitted such an adorable and interactive video that we just had to reach out and see what she was going to do with it. So she's actually started a business that we're going to document and show everyone how it's done. So this isn't exactly what Cindy's doing, but she's making jewelry a lot like this. And uh, do we have her uh, photo we can throw up? Okay, yeah, I'm so sorry. Which the show? video of uh, Cindy. Here's actually something that Cindy uh, made, which isn't jewelry. She uh, went a little Hi. outside her Today zone. Today I'll be showing she you how to make a well-mounted bottle opener uh, with your Mies so laser cutter. So check this out as it comes through. Go uh, ahead and download the file at the link below. And make sure uh, that your Mies is properly set up. Catch for it in the bottom, Once you cut out all your pieces, some, um, I use 8-inch maple plywood. So you can begin to assemble the bottle opener. So the panel. Uh, which looks Take your great. two largest um, pieces and, she made this cool little stop and spread a thin video, layer of wood glue um, so that on she can show the assembly. So she I double layered the back there so she could have a little bit of earth and a place to, to hang it. An even bond. And then as she brought it in, you can see she clamped Once it down using the wood dried, and allowed at least an hour for that to dry. Now that's just smart and good woodworking. Take the bottom piece so cheers and glue it to place, followed by the side pieces and then the front. And as you can see there, you notch those pieces together and have a little catch for your buttons. You can get one of these at any hardware store Bottle cap Celebrate opener, by popping and open the there you one. go. Cheers. Uh, just like that. And if you're interested in making that, uh, there'll be a link down below um, on this uh, blog, and you can actually download that file. Cindy's uh, anxious to see if other people want to make it, so you could personalize it, add your own logo on there, put man cave or uh, lady cave or what do they call it, the she cave or so I'm not sure. I don't know what the people are doing these days. Uh, but um, anything you want to personalize, favorite football team, basketball team, what have you. Uh, you could throw that on there and um, have a personalized bottle opener uh, for your uh, for your space. Uh, so what else we have? So I just have the uh, next one. Okay, so uh, Brett and Kylie uh, Mabry uh, with Mabry Makings and their wood engravings. Now check these things out. They are just gorgeous. Now as you can see here, that's a just a. Um, uh, cutting board, which is an easy, uh, easy thing to do as a gift or just to start a business. You go to Alibaba or another place and buy, uh, buy them in bulk. You can get a bunch of uh, uh, cutting boards and personalize them uh, and then sell them with anything. Uh, what else do we have here for them? Oh, uh, this is one of my favorites they do. So they've cut out these uh, words here on the welcome sign and then place it on that uh, barnwood and it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous addition uh, to any home. I love that look. Kind of reminds me of something Joanna Gaines or Chip Gaines would put on a uh, fixer upper. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what I like about this is it's not super complex. It's very simple, and it's just executed very cleanly. Very, That's very well. This is something a laser can do super easy, and it just like looks amazing. Absolutely. Um, so you can check them out. Please give them a follow at Mabry Makings. Uh, you can have their link. I think it's yep right there. Super white. And backwards. Yeah, it's a little white. It's whiter than my skin appears in this video. It's impossible. Which is pretty hard to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's down uh, the Mabry makings down there below. There we go. Appreciate that, Charles. Well, put a little. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, so let's go on to uh, you know the last little bit here. Uh, as always, uh, we have a survey. 
We'd love to hear from you. We take these surveys very seriously. This survey has led to RE3. It's led to improvements such as the cool box. It's led to uh, different items such as, um, oh, uh, one of my favorite things, uh, having tech support and different frequently asked questions on the website. Uh, Laser 101 came from a survey suggestion. So please take just a moment. Let us know how we're doing. Please let us know where we could be better. Let us know what you'd like to see, if there's something that we're missing the mark on. Uh, and if we're doing something great, we'd love to hear that too. It's not just about uh, you know the yes, negative please. criticism. Please, uh, sometimes uh, it's a little overwhelming <coughs> just hearing all the uh, things that you know, we're not quite hitting the mark on. Um, but uh, you know we take all those things uh, right in stride and we knock them out. And that's how in a year, you know I think Muse we released just about a year ago. And we're already in development of you know another generation of Muse that has autofocus and a few other uh, gadgets and Gasmos inside to make it just a little bit more efficient and a little bit easier to use, including the cool box. But right now with the cool box, we have a great deal that we're actually going to do. And uh, starting today, uh, for a very limited time with a limited offering, we're going to do the cool box and the Muse for five thousand dollars. So a five thousand dollar price point, Muse cool box, special time, limited sale. We'll have a graphic right here in just a second, I believe. Or is it going to be? Nope. You didn't send it over to him. Okay, I guess we missed an email or something, but we'll have that graphic up and uh, you'll see that on our Facebook page, uh, hopefully in just one a few One hour minutes. build, too. Uh, yeah, and we'll one mention hour. it this uh, Friday at one hour build, but uh, Ruben will get that posted on our Facebook wall. Look for a link there. Give your sales uh, guy a call. Give us a call or email at sales at fslaser.com if you're interested in that. Don't forget, we also have the Pro 20 uh, sales still going on, 4500 bucks for the uh, Pro 20 with the chiller. Um, so, go. what's that? We, we have the bottom oh, for that. Oh, have the bottom for that. There we go. Um, just missed one. That's not bad. No. Two, two, one or two is not bad. Um, so usual categories uh, at the end. Uh, we have one big announcement because we have a winner coming in from the weekly contest. Mm -hmm. Robin Paulus for his tree lantern. Check this cool thing out. Nope. <laughs> wow. So Oy. everyone that's not on camera right now is fired. <laughs> Everyone's fired. Um, oh, catastrophic man. failures on all ends. Uh, Robin, At least though, we know his amazing name. thing. I saw the photo and it's amazing. Uh, it's yeah. great work. Uh, obviously, very, uh, very worthy <laughs> of winning. We're apologizing. The graphics missing. We'll get you up on the one-hour build on Friday. Um, what's up, uh, Ruben? Ru Ruben? Looks like Ruben's gonna post it up there. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Oh, got a question oh. right here. One of the first news that shipped, I think I have. I don't know where that tape was so far. Uh, Aziz Musadi, uh, very uh, well. I'm very glad you guys are here to help. And yes, it's great uh, that you're behind the products. I run the Facebook Muse page. Oh, hey, oh, what's going what's on, man? How you doing, dude? Um, I think I have number 19. Aziz, yeah, you had one of the very first Muse got out the door. I remember uh, your uh, actually unboxing video was the very first uh, time that someone outside Full Spectrum posted a video of the Muse getting unboxed. Uh, we were oh we yeah, were, I saw that. One. Yeah, we were amped uh, that you actually started the Facebook page. We appreciate. It. We we're uh, obviously on there all the no, time. Uh, no issues at all. No issues, uh, problem with the machine at all. Well, that's awesome, man. I appreciate you stopping and saying that, dude. Thanks See, so much. That's a good example of somebody who's happy and said something. Yeah, I do appreciate it. You usually hear the complaints yeah. most. Which, I mean, is one out of a hundred. Yeah, but, but they're, they're the loudest, absolutely. right? Absolutely. You don't um, say, I'm so happy that loud. Did we <laughs> I'm glad you got a kick out of that disease. Uh, do we have another question over there, Ruben? Right now. Okay, sorry about that. Ken, though, sorry, we had one that wrote in earlier. Ken asked, uh, what's the difference between the glass and metal CO2 tubes in terms of cutting? Is metal worth the extra cost? It really depends. There's, there's probably, let's say we had a spectrum of all the things that a metal CO2 laser could do, and it was this long. The things that a glass CO2 laser could do, mm, it's probably this long. So you're really, the uh, 10 or 15% difference that the two machines can do based on the the price difference no like a metal tube costs as much as probably one of our largest pros just the tube absolutely so uh but price that difference but the but the thing is that that tube will also last eight to ten years uh, that's that's a big a difference in time. the longevity uh, but as far as uh, cost of getting into the machine um it's kind of like the example of if you can afford a maserati why not? There's, I mean, it's a terrific car to drive. It's an amazing day-to-day -day driver. It's, uh, they're terrific. The leather seats, they just tickle your back as you sit down. It's, it's a terrific vehicle. But it's most of the time more realistic for most people to buy a Nissan or a, 
Altmall or something yeah. along those lines. It's more of a realistic uh, price point and very reliable and gets from point A to point B. And I think uh, most of your customers aren't going to be like, wow, this was this was done with a metal tube instead of a CO2. But here's the, uh, the, the bare bones to it. With a metal CO2 tube, you're going to have a much more power, a much more consistent power. It's going to run faster. It's going to, so you're going to have a, your variable power rate is going to be much, much uh, shorter. So you're going to be able to do variable power speedings. Like you can see actually the difference on like Kern and Epilog some of their engravings. The reason they're able to get that variable depth is basically from the metal tube and the precision of the laser head. Um, the cost of the metal laser tubes are just ridiculous though. It's high. It's uh, very high. So we'd rather, you know, an epilogue zing I think cost eight grand. I uh, w Wouldn't you rather get two hobby lasers for that? Like I, I mean just I consider would. that like I could always do twice as much with one laser than I could with one no matter how fast the one is. Um, mm. That's all there is to it. Like um, with engravings, um, with the dual source, like some of the competitors have, obviously you can make an argument for that. Um, but again, we're talking, you could buy your teenager the most reliable car they'll have <laughs> for, the, for the same price. Um, yeah. Like maybe a brand new car in some cases. Um, uh, you know, it's just how much do you want to spend? And uh, where we live in the market is for the person who is well beyond a you know truly beginner unit like a Glowforge or some of the other people that are um, built uh, based off a you know crowdsource thing. For the people who have a serious interest in lasers and are moving forward with their laser, and people who have a you know, I want to use their laser as an artisan and as a producer. Um, you know, micro manufacturing and manufacturing in a small space is possible because of lasers like ours. And at a price point that ranges between, you know, like our Pro 20 at $4,500 with a chiller up to the uh, Pro 20, uh, Pro 48, um, those price points uh, you can, just can't beat uh, with competitors that use metal tubes. And that's really the biggest difference um, in, the, uh, in your approach. Sounds like a Z's said that uh, he got one or looked at one for a while? Yeah, Z's looks like uh, he had a rep bring one by the house as well. It's just, uh, again, price was the only thing that, uh, that was uh, uh, the issue. Uh, looks like Jeff Hayes had a question. I have not tried to cut MDF. Any recommendations? Quality. <laughs> if you buy low quality MDF, like if you just go to Home Depot and get quarter inch MDF, understand that the laser's passing through mostly glue. So yeah, it's difficult. you're going to, a lot of the times you have to do two passes. So if you think about it and you make a groove that's about halfway through, three quarters of the way through the MDF, adjust your focus down, you know, three quarters of the depth so that your focus point is now at the new surface where it's hitting and then run it at a higher speed. So you don't want to stay in that trough a very long time so your MDF uh, burns up. Once you do your first pass, do your second and third passes if needed at much higher speeds. Um, adjusting your current too in the 75 to 80 range will help a lot with MDF and other glues because really it's the when you have a lot of power um, going down to the material it's a, that's heat and that heat just makes that glue melt and then seep back into the channel you've created so as that coagulation happens in the channel uh, the more heat just adds to that mess so the less heat you can put into that channel as you're cutting the better off so remember that current is the amount of power that's getting to the uh, tube and the power setting is how many times the lasers pulsing uh, as it uh, moves along the line yeah MDF and definitely watch your machine yes yeah, keep an eye on it yeah it, it's uh, it's press sawdust really yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it's sawdust and glue pressed will, into boards. It yeah. sounds like it's going to catch fire, so just watch it. Yeah, a house made of MDF would burn down essentially immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it, would do, it would have no contest. If you ever want to start a fire, uh, go get some MDF and break it up and throw it on. It'll, it'll immediately it's catch. It's good kindling. Yeah, the thing is, though, a lot of glue inside, so just keep that in mind. And keep that in mind, too, when you're buying uh, plywood. Like, um, Actually, we got some of Glowforge's, um, what do they call it, the proof grade? Yeah, Their yeah. proof gain material is two pieces of veneer with basically MDF uh, in between. We notice that that's a, I mean, to me, that's a big miss as far as com composition and uh, what you use. Um, with uh, like this, we used our Romark material, which as you can see, I don't know if we can get zoomed in on that. That's three layers of hardwood in there with a very, very even display of glue. So when you're doing cuts, you're able to get that perfect amber cut on the edge there where the uh, thickness of the material is very evident. Um, what we always try to do, it's almost like a contest here, is who can get the more perfect amber char around their cut. And when you get that cut where it's just a little bit of brown and you get a cut through on the wood, it's... Uh, 
It's yeah. almost like hitting a home run. I don't know. I haven't hit a home run before, but I'm sure it feels a lot like that. Yeah, I haven't yeah. hit a baseball with a bat ever. So. <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, the, the key is if you wipe it and yeah. it doesn't come off on your fingers, yeah. that's a great the power job. setting. Absolutely. Uh, so charring um, is basically too much heat over too, uh, staying in the trough too much time. So you want to keep your speed of your laser up, especially when you're using materials that have a lot of glue. All plies have a glue layer in between those sections, so just keep that in mind. If it doesn't go through on your first pass, take a second pass, but just know that you're fighting now through a little bit more glue that has seeped back into that trough. Okay. Any more? Michael Spencer on Facebook. Do you folks know of any photo engraving techniques that are more sophisticated than importing a JPEG and dithering it? It seems to be sort of uh, a black art and usually held close to the vest as a trade secret. It is a little bit of a trade secret, um, but luckily we created an ebook that delicately teaches you how to go through, helps you edit your photo, and really get the best uh, method for it. Um, it's right here. Actually, yes. I believe there's a blog post that just um, touches on this specifically as well. Um, Ruben will throw that down uh, as a link in the, uh, the uh, description of this. Uh, really the things you want to remember is contrast and focus. If your picture's not exposed well, it's not in focus, and there's no contrast, it's just kind of a blur of color, there's not going to be much to engrave. Um, look at it in black and white. Uh, that is essentially how the laser is going to look at it. So there's no point to consider the photo in color at all. Um, you want to put it into a black and white filter one way or the other, whether it's dithering it in Photoshop, putting it into a black and white fi uh, uh, filter in Photoshop. Uh, one way or another, you want to get into that uh, gradient grayscale so you can understand how the laser is going to see your photo. Now, the other thing to consider is on the photo, the dark parts of the photos will be deep the light parts of the photos will not have anything touching on it. So there's three settings over on the side of your software that are, um, right where they are, I think it's luminescence. Um, there are basically three touch-ups you can do on the dither. Um, play around with those a little bit. Um, we have a blog post that kind of shows what those different things do as well. Um, you want to have enough brightness in your photo that you can see the shadows, but you want to have enough contrast where you're like, you're, you know, you're like, see how this is kind of blown out up here um, where it's white? This might not engrave really yeah. well, but um, our faces have good contrast. And like on Walker's face, you can easily see contrast between his hair and his forehead and his eyes and his beard. And underneath his chin has a good shadow. He has a different colored shirt than he does from his hoodie. This would all engrave really well because there's a lot of contrast on all those things on his face and, uh, and shirts. But uh, for instance, me, my milky white skin <laughs> blending into this white <laughs> shirt, which is a great decision today, um, just kind of gets washed out when I back up into the bright light. And I would not engrave very well. You I would just, just kind of look almost like, like two creepy eyes. Yeah, just floating. two eyes floating in the middle with a little two <laughs> dots for the nose. Basically, this is how gray aliens came about. Yeah. They were doing engravings of my face. Too and much exposure. You know, just had a little bit of, yeah. Um, so remember, exposure is very important. Uh, so having a good balance, especially in your black and white contrast. A lot of times, if you're using Photoshop, they have like a yellow filter or a blue filter, which is great when you're doing things with outside that has a lot of greens and a lot of blues, and you want to separate the trees from the skies. Uh, so just keep that in mind as you're doing editing. And two, I can't emphasize this enough, if you're doing it on your phone, almost every cell phone is taking a photo well worthy enough to engrave. Make mm. sure you're sending the full size photo from your phone to wherever you're editing it from. So if you're sending it via chat or email, make sure you select full size photo. Like don't take the shortcut and send the little size. Don't save data on your phone by taking small photos. Take the largest size photo you can because really it's all about pixel data. The more pixels you have, the more data you have, and then the more really accurate engraving you can do. Especially if it's large. And I feel like just saying like you can't drag a photo off uh, Google and have it come out right is completely wrong because no, you can absolutely. It, it you just have to find the right photo. Yeah, it's yeah. all about the photo and yeah. the contrast. Absolutely. Um, so then there are tons of great photos if you yeah. look up high contrast uh, images. If that's something you want to use, that will dither awesome. Yeah, if you looked up like a, a high contrast black and white photo on Google, a bunch of great headshots and different things will pop up. Try engraving one of those and uh, see what a professional photographer who's 
completely perfectly exposed the shot. It has a good gradient from dark shadow to uh, to highlight without any overexposure and without having any shadows completely blacked out. And give that an engraving with just a drag and drop and see what the outcome is. You'd be really surprised how well the dither works at 500 dpi uh, with a great photo like that. One thing I'd like to add before we move on is material as well. So if you're Absolutely. doing black granite, inverse that awesome image and then it's because it's going to mark white. And really in the granite, you don't want to use 500 DPI. You actually want to use a 250 DPI uh, when you're doing um, scorching. I don't want to say scorching. You're just doing a... You're what's, just what removing the, uh, the polish. What really. would you call that, though? Uh, etching. Etching. Yeah. Basically just a, a, a black and white etching is what you're doing with a... If you're doing it on granite. So you kind of kind of remember that... Uh, just like with a newspaper, that density of dots, you kind of have to see and be apparent. A lot of times with a higher uh, DPI on granite, I found that the image just kind of gets washed out and you can't really see it, it just kind of looks muddy. Um, almost similar to engraving on acrylic. Yeah, it's just, it's going to react and that's it. Wood, you can see all those subtleties with Absolutely. the lightness and darkness, but not so much with granite and uh, acrylic. Another thing with photo engraving that's part of the black art is really power. So if you have a, a um, I guess this is a three millimeter uh, birch ply, it looks like. Now, if you're engraving past the first layer of that into the second layer, you're going to have some different outcomes. So if your darkest parts are going into the second layer, it's actually going to look like you engraved down to something clean, like a new color. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, no. You need to quit shuffling your legs, Walker. You're a little busy pants Dang. over here, and it's messing with the audio. Oh, no. Jeez Kill Louise. Killing our ears, Walker. Shoot. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, we'll turn we'll my keep, mic off. We'll keep like a leash on or something. Don't <laughs> turn your mic <laughs> off. That's kidding. ridiculous. Uh, so power settings are a big thing. As you can see, the guys at Glider Tech here, they actually did a great job on this engraving. Let me back up so it's in focus there. It's not too deep. It's got a nice, solid fill there. And with a photo engraving, do we have one in the um, room at all? We'll have to grab one for next week. But the, uh, the photo engraving, too much power is always going to be trouble because as soon as you have too much power, it's going to muddy up a lot of the dark areas. So it's a very nice balance and it's always based on the density of your wood and the type of machine you have. So if you have an older fifth gen that you've been using for a few years, you have to do a little bit more power. If you have a brand new 90 watt, 24 inch a pro, probably have to go on the very, very low end uh, to engrave on like a balsa wood that you'd get at Michael's or on Amazon or for Romark. Anything else? Oh, from Boston, one of my favorite cities on the planet. Any tips from engraving uh, semi-aniline leather with a Pro 24 90 watt laser? Jeremy in Boston asks. This is a leather ex expert right here. Um, any tips? I, I always say the same thing with anything really, but with leather, it's if you're engraving, start low power. Uh, low power, low TB DPI, and adjust ac like accordingly. If Absolutely. You, it depends on really what you want as an outcome, but I've done a leather piece and it turned out what I thought was perfect, but then when I took it out of the machine, hmm. the engraving wasn't dark enough. Yeah. And I could have just bumped that DPI up to actually give it contrast. Absolutely. Now there's applications where sometimes you don't want a lot of contrast. Maybe you just want to give it some texture, some cool look, and that would be perfect. But going higher DPI and playing with that power setting is really key. Absolutely. Another thing to consider with the leather is you are engraving <sighs> it's flesh it's flesh it, it was it, it's an organic it was once living uh, so just keep that in mind that um, the taping it off and having clean edges there's a few things you can do technique wise to kind of help you out so you can run the vector after the raster to help clean up the edges of leather when you're doing engraving especially with solid fill and it really helps the uh, fidelity of those edges out just make sure that that edge is ran a little slow. You don't want it too fast. Absolutely. Um, another thing, I guess that's a good point to bring up in general. When you're using your laser, if you're looking for a very accurate thing, if what you're trying to do is a very accurate photo, a very accurate cut, there's, there's no reason to have the speed pedal all the way to the floor. Um, I always make the example with the car. You wouldn't you wouldn't just get in your car and then start by putting the gas pedal all the way to the floor and just trying to drive where you're going at the top speed your car would go. Um, you would use the appropriate speed for turns, for straightaways, for the freeway, for residential areas. 
It's the same thing with the laser. Um, I rarely run my laser at 100% speed unless I'm doing something where I'm trying to be very delicate and just put a little bit of a touch on something. Or if I'm cutting cardstock, a lot of times that's at 100 speed. But honestly, mm -hmm. I usually slow that down to 90 speed and cut my current way down so I don't have any chance of scorching or cutting the edge of the cardstock. Um, but those little techniques that you kind of learn as you go. Um, adjusting your current and power. Um, we're actually going to, in newer versions of the software, we're going to combine current and power into a single slider as an option so that as you move down, you're actually utilizing the benefit of adjusting both of those at the same time. Um, with speed, you can't say enough about how going at, tw like a lot of things, I'll go at 21% speed uh, with doing it in a, a, a detailed engraving just so that I know that each pass is going to get a good laying of that, that power. It's going to have a very accurate display of each one of the, uh, you know, essentially the laser beams uh, going down, the jackhammer of light power that's touching my material. Um, I'm making sure that each one of those are precisely laid. If you look in your Muse, there's actually two settings. There's um, fast and precise mode, and one mode that you know combines both. I keep mine in precise, um, mostly because the 15 or 20 percent speed faster doesn't really. I mean, I'm in no hurry to go anywhere. Like there, I can see the Curse of Oak Island from you know where my Muse is at home. If you haven't seen the show, check it out. It's really great. The Lagina Brothers are from Michigan. What's up, guys? Um, the laser, though as it goes slower, it's just inherently more accurate like anything. So keep that in mind as you're doing anything from delicate cuts, whether it's something like this. I'd much rather go through and do this cut at a little bit slower speed, just so I have a little bit more accuracy. But when you're doing that, what do you have to remember on acrylic? So it's going to melt. Is What it's doing with acrylic is it's cutting through and melting it. And if you have fine details and you have a cut that comes together, it might melt both sides and just take that detail away. So what's something you have to kind of do uh, when you're doing that? What do you have to adjust? You can adjust your power, your speed, and your, your current. current. Yeah. All the power settings available. Right, so slower speed isn't always the best option, especially with things like acrylic. Sometimes you've got to get in there and just get the job done. Uh, my philosophy personally is go as fast as you can. Um, I don't think there's any need to go slower than you have to, but no. um, I always start slower and then work my way up to a speed that's comfortable. I usually start below what I think is needed and then slowly work my way into a speed that's really comfortable. And then, like always, I use the little uh, PDF charts that we have on the material test on Laser 101 and keep track of what each material is. That way, when I get another piece of the same material, I just check my chart and uh, you know dial in my settings right there. And that's probably my favorite thing about RA3, too, is they remember your settings for, like, red colored vectors, so I kind of have my nice. own little code um, when I design now, so if I'm designing something for paper, I just use green and purple lines, and those green and purple lines are, you know, settings for paper. If I'm doing yeah. wood, I use red and etc. I kind of do the same thing with my RE1, except in my brain. <laughs> I go, oh, that'll work. <laughs> okay. All right, I think that's all we got for this week. Um, we do have the uh, weekly contest. Don't forget to uh, submit to that. Um, check it out on Facebook. Do we have any changes for that, Ruben, this week? Yeah, this week is we're doing it through Laser 101. So any previous project and you're making it your own. Absolutely. So this week for the weekly contest, it's got a little bit of a twist to it. You have to go on to Laser 101, either one of the uh, nine projects that teach you how to use it or one of the great projects that Walker has designed. Uh, and make it your own. Uh, submit a photo of what you've made. It could be as simple as the business card holder or what's the most complex thing you think you've done so far? I think the birdhouse was probably like step by step the longest. Yeah, so the birdhouse, that was a great one. Uh, Mother's Day is just around the corner. That's a great gift for uh, grandmas and mothers. Uh, they love when you make them things and give them to them rather than going and buying oh, yeah. a thoughtful gift. They really do. I make stuff Ask around. with the laser cutter for my grandma all the time and she goes, how can you yeah. make this? Put right. your heart into something. I promise you your mom will get a bigger kick out of it than going to the jewelry store and just getting something off the rack. Uh, put a little love into it. And uh, until next week, you know, uh, send us all your questions. Remember, this guy's looking for a challenge. Send him something that he can make on the one hour build that you don't think he can. This actually came from a challenge. Someone said, hey, I'm a maker. I want to do a dice tower. Can you show me how it can be done? And we did a great dice tower like that. There's actually a second rendition of it that's a little bit more simple. You can make this your own. You don't have to have necessarily the old uh, Joker skull face there, but you can have... Um, that's the Skeleton King. The sal Skeleton uh. King. I was uh, unaware. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're actually going to, on uh, a one hour build coming up, uh, show you how to do your own tokens for gamers 
cutters for those of you that do board gamings. Um, laser cutters are a perfect application for those type of people uh, who have, uh, whether it's, uh, what would you call those, Scott? Um, first player, what, what type of game? Games. A role playing game. Yeah. So like a Dungeons tabletop and Dragon games. tabletop uh, role playing game. You can make your own board game pieces and stuff too. Absolutely. So your own board game pieces, your own players, your own tokens. So um, those of you out there that are in the uh, D&D realm, which I believe I used that word correctly, um, you could make your own character and bring it to your next gathering of, what do you call it, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> next <laughs> gathering of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I, thought replace your monopoly piece. I thought there was like a thing, a campaign? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah, right. campaign. Um, I just watched the last episode of Freaks and Geeks where James Franco plays Dungeons and Dragons. So. Um, I got so a you know everything. Now. I know basically everything about Dungeons and Dragons. Cool um, he's a real cool guy, and he likes Dungeons and Dragons now. And then he's now a movie star. So good for you. Um, what else do we have? I guess that's it with the Muse Cool Box combo for five thousand. Don't forget about that deal. Give us a call. Uh, we got the Pro forty five hundred with the Chiller. Two great deals if you're looking for something. If you're a maker space or education unit, we actually have a great deal for multiple units. You can get six Muse shipped on a pallet for the price of five. That's a huge saving. That's five thousand dollars off the Muse. Uh, so if you're a maker space, a school district, an EDU, or if you just have six friends that want to save a few bucks, you know, you know, gather up and we can work something out. Oh, yeah. uh, but give us a call. A um, yeah, I mean that's what I would do. I'd put up a little, uh, you know, uh, lost cat type thing with a little pull mm -hmm. tab in my neighborhood and hope six people pull off a thing where they want to buy a muse. We can all save a thousand bucks. It's a pretty good deal. Um, I guess uh, I guess till next time. Make sure you check out that survey. Um, make something for Laser 101 and the weekly contest and. Uh, Think keep making. Ke oh, that's yeah. Keep making. Keep making. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you next time.